Hmm. Hmm. All right. So we'll we'll see how it is. All right. You guys see that? Okay. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to start up on toxicology today, and you guys are going to be very um, anxious, and you're going to want to write down every tiny little detail. I just know. I know some of you are going to be like that. You're going to want to write down every little detail. Really anxious is the most important stuff in the world. Um, here's the thing that we need to remember before we get into all this stuff. Okay, what what I really want you guys to to take home is that most people who overdose are going to survive. Okay, most people will survive, assuming one major thing happens to them and what is that what is that major thing if you had to guess what do you think most people need overdose what kind of care supportive care supportive care there you go there you guys go let the body deal with it yep over 90 percent of all overdoses will survive if the only thing they get is supportive care, okay? The only thing they get is supportive care, most people will survive. So what I mean by supportive care? Well, I mean ABCs, open their airway, make sure they're breathing, okay? Augment their circulatory status, okay? If they, need, if they look like they need volume, you give them volume. If they need pressors, you give them pressors, right? They're seizing, you give them medicines to stop, stop their seizures, benzodiazepines, right? You do the basic supportive stuff, okay? Um, most people will survive. Of the people that don't survive from supportive care, okay, only, so of the, of the, of the you know, the, the less than 10%, Okay, that that truly need complex care. Um, only about a third of them will be viable. Okay, so a third of that that less than ten percent, you will be able to do something about. Two thirds of them will be so sick, so overdosed, you know, so critically ill that they probably will not survive regardless of what we do to them. Okay, so um, the the take home story is. You're going to get very anxious about what is the drug and what is the antidote and what is this and what is that. And, and frankly, you're not going to remember much of that. So I want you to remember good supportive care. Okay, Everybody gets good supportive care. And that includes simple things like checking blood sugars, right? Okay, Oxygen saturations, getting a 12 lead, fluids, right? The, just the simple things. The simple ABCs that, that we should be doing, and, and a lot of people will do okay there. So, with that in mind, let's talk about toxicology. What is toxicology? Toxicology is nothing more than pharmacology. That's really all it is. It's a specialized form of pharmacology. It's pharmacology gone bad, as I like to say. Okay, the, the father, uh, quote unquote, Okay, of toxicology is a guy by the name of Paracelsus. Okay, and he kind of coined the term, um, quote unquote, um, uh, it's not verbatim because he, well, this is in, the, I believe, the 14, 14 1500s, um, uh, so the beginning of the Renaissance, but he basically said the dose makes the poison. So anything can become a poison, anything can become toxic, and it's really just a matter of the dose, right? If you take too much of it, it'll kill you. It's really that simple. <laughs> um, that's really what toxicology is about. It's pharmacology gone bad. So too much, um, too much stuff to memorize. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about toxidromes today. We're going to talk about general problems. These are toxic syndromes, and there are a constellation of substances that cause similar signs and symptoms. And so what do we do? We treat them in essentially the same way, okay? Did he overdose on methamphetamine or did he overdose on cocaine? It's going to be really hard to differentiate that if you don't have information, right? Luckily, the treatment is the same for the most part, the emergency treatment. Okay, so the toxidromes are going to be very helpful. We'll talk about those. Also, getting help, dial a friend. Does everyone know the number for poison control? 
at 1-800-222-1222. And remember those, yeah, remember those, those commercials, right? If you think you've been poisoned and you don't know what to do, you dial 1-800-222-1222, right? Anyway, um, so that's a resource that you can dial. They can help you out. They can give you suggestions. They have a lot more information than you do right at their fingertips there. Um, some terminology you want to be familiar with, this is just going back to pharmacology, ED 50%, TD 50%, and LD 50%. What do those all mean? Yeah, so ED is the effective dose 50%. So that's the effect that we're looking for for whatever substance or drug, right? Right. That is the dose that is effective in 50% of a population. Right? TD 50% is the toxic dose 50%. That's the dose that is that causes <coughs> side effects. Okay, when we say toxicity, that's what we mean, is, is it reliably causes side effects in 50% of a population. And then LD50 is the lethal dose. It's the dose that results in death in 50% of population. Oftentimes, these are done with animals, right? We do this testing on animals, and then using something known as allometric scaling, we try to scale that up to human beings, and that's you know, varying degrees of success there. Okay, guys, cool with that? So, there are what we call these toxidromes, as I talked about, and there are six classical toxidromes that exist. And we'll talk about them today. The cholinergic, the anticholinergic, the sympathomimetic, the opioid, the hallucinogenic, and the sedative hypnotic. And most of the commonly encountered toxicants, or some people call these xenobiotics. That's kind of a, a term of the month, a xenobiotic. Biotic is just a biological substance that came from outside of the body, right? Okay, so there. if you see that word, don't let it scare you. It just means, oh, a toxin came in from the outside. Um, we'll fall into these six categories. All right, um, just some other odds and ends. Questions that you want to ask every time you run across a potential toxicological emergency, just remember poison. Okay, so P. So poisons. Do can you identify what is involved? And can you get some sort of estimated dose? How much was taken? How many pills are missing? Can I get some sort of estimate of how much was done? This can be really difficult. O is outside the body. What form was the toxicant in? outside of the body? Was it in the form of a pill? Was it, was it a liquid? Was it is inhaled as a vapor or a gas? Okay, what's the form? Okay, and then inside of the body, okay, how did it get into the body? Was it ingested? Was it inhaled? Was it absorbed through the skin or some other membrane? Okay, um, and then where is it distributing within the body? Right? Is, do we know? Do we know? Is it a very fat soluble? If it's very lipid soluble, then we know it's probably going to go into the fatty compartments in the brain. If it's very polar, we know that it's probably going to stay in the blood, right? In the blood plasma. If it is highly protein bound, we know that it will be attached or it will sequester itself to plasma proteins, okay? Um, S is the sequence of time events, okay? What has gone on with this patient over time, okay? Can, when do we know? When did this happen, okay? How long ago did this happen? And how is the patient now, okay? You know, how are they trending? O, other problems. We always need to consider differential diagnoses. Common things to consider would be like hypoglycemia, stroke, STEMI. Okay, these things can alter mental status. They can make our patients appear as though there may be some sort of toxicology involved. Okay, so that's part of the reason why we do check blood sugars, even though we know lots of drugs can alter blood sugars. But, right, we check our blood sugars. We check our temperature, right? We do a 12-lead um, when possible, those kinds of things. And then net effects. Look at the patient as a whole. 
how do they look at as a whole? What are their vital signs? What, their, what is their physical assessment? How are they presenting? And in general, how are they looking? Okay, so that's the poison mnemonic. Okay, um, some other selected problems that we'll talk about. We won't get to these today, but some individual agents that present with specific toxicities. Um, aspirin, acetaminophen, al ethanol, obviously, our toxic alcohols, cyanide, carbon monoxide, heavy metals, lead, iron, mercury, and arsenic. Okay, lead, lead and... Um, Iron are probably the most common heavy metal talk, uh, heavy metal emergencies, with lead by far being the most common. Uh, digoxin, and that can come in the form of a pill, or it can come from um, certain plants. Beta blocker overdose, calcium channel blockers, tricyclic antidepressants, and abnormal forms of hemoglobin, such as met hemoglobin. Okay, and we'll talk about these in more detail, but not today. So, what's the general approach to someone? with a toxicological emergency. Why well, just think of safely, recess, and RSI the dead? Okay, that's just something I came up with. Safely, recess, and RSI the dead. Okay, so let's start at safely. So first, safety, right? BSI, prevent exposure, okay? You want to protect yourself first and foremost, okay? So that's your safety, right? Resuscitation, okay, this is what? CPR. Well, when I resuscitate somebody's poison, yeah, that's the support of care, yeah. The ABCs control seizures, blood glucose and temperature control, and specific antidotes if they exist. For the most part, good antidotes don't exist for a lot of overdoses, a lot of different overdoses, but there are some notable antidotes and antidote-like therapies. Risks, okay, do you know the agent? It, can we figure out the dose, the time, the route, any comorbidities, right? Okay, if somebody has diabetes or they have congestive heart failure, you know, those are comorbidities. Don't forget supportive care. Investigations, we should be doing 12 leads. We should institute capnography, waveform capnography. We should get labs if they're available. Okay, what are some of the most important labs going to be for toxicology? Okay, so blood chemistry, right? A complete metabolic panel, a CMP. Blood chemistry and... That's concluded in the CMP. And... Arterial blood gas, yeah. A urine tox screen is of little benefit for us, okay? A, a urine drug screen doesn't really tell us much of anything. It tells us that there are metabolites for some substance within the, the half-life of those metabolites, okay? So it, it doesn't really tell us much of anything. Um, but a, a, a complete metabolic panel and an arterial blood gas are going to be the highest yield tests we can do. Um, in addition to the, the bedside test, the, the, the blood glucose, which is also covered in a CMP, the 12 lead, the capnography. And from the ABG and the CMP, we can get the anion gap. We can get the osmol, osmolol gap, et cetera. Okay, decontaminate if possible, right? If they've got stuff all over them, do they need washed off? Do they need brushed off if it's a powder? Um, is, is it something that can be decontaminated from within, right? With, can charcoal potentially help? Enhanced elimination, right? Are there things that we can do to enhance the elimination of that toxicant, right? For example, sodium bicarbonate <coughs> may enhance urinary elimination of certain things. Dialysis may enhance the elimination of certain things. Are there antidotes available, okay? Um, and then disposition. That's where does this patient go? What is ultimately done with them? An appropriate facility. In Las Cruces, New Mexico, right, it's pretty simple. We have two major hospitals. But you probably wouldn't take a beta blocker overdose to your local emergency care clinic, right? Okay. Um, so, yeah, good deal. You guys cool with that? Yeah. All right, moving right along. Okay, so let's cover these general principles. 
Again, guys, most overdose patients will survive with good supportive care. Okay. So under the umbrella of general principles, have you guys ever heard of something called a coma cocktail? Oh, yeah. You guys have heard of that, yeah. And so what this is, is this is something that we used to give every single patient with, a, with possible uh, toxicology or, or every patient that presents in coma. You give them dextrose, you give them Narcan, you give them thymine, you give them flumazenil. Okay, we don't do that now. Stop. Don't do that, okay? So we check their BGL. And if they need dextrose, we give them dextrose. And what are things that can cause dextrose to get low? Well, calcium channel blockers, alcohol or ethanol, salicylates, acetaminophen, insulin, beta blockers, oral hypoglycemic agents like metformin. These are all agents that are known to cause a low BGL. So if your BGL is low, you think about, okay, could these things be involved? Okay. Naloxolone. Do we just willy-nilly give everybody naloxolone? No. no. We give it if we suspect an opioid is involved. Might we give naloxolone to somebody who's down and out and we have no idea what's going on? Yes. It is actually something to consider because what is the most commonly overdosed agent right now? Opioids, yeah, opioids, by, by large, yeah. Okay, now how do we give the naloxone if we suspect an opioid, if an opioid toxidrome is presenting? Do we slam them with two milligrams IV push? No, we titrate it to respiratory. Titrate it to effect, right? You don't necessarily want a patient that's awake and wanting to go out to the club and dance. That's not necessary. You want a patient who is breathing adequately and protecting their airway, right? That's ultimately what you want. So you titrate it, right? So instead of slamming two milligrams into them, maybe give 0 0.4 milligrams and see how they do, right? Um, because there is a possibility of precipitating withdrawal, right? Opioid withdrawal. Now, generally, is opioid withdrawal life-threatening? Generally not. It's very uncomfortable, but it's generally not life-threatening. But occasionally, it can be problematic, right? And the patients can be a little anxious, and they can get a little aggressive. It's not like it's somewhat overblown. You know, people are like, oh, you give him withdrawal, and he'll, he'll seize and die, and his head will spin off and roll down the floor and spontaneously combust in the, the broom closet and all that. Well, not, not typically. But you do want to be, you know, very careful. You want to titrate and maybe give them, start off with 0 0.4, right, and see how they do, and then give another 0 0.4, and just, you'll know, be a bit more cautious than slamming two milligrams. Now, sometimes two milligrams get slammed, right? You arrive on scene, and the, the intermediate or even the basic may have already slammed them with Narcan, and you've got to deal with it, so there, there it is. Thymine, right? If your patient looks malnourished, give them thymine. Right? It's generally not going to hurt them, and as long as there aren't any contraindications or they're, you, know, you don't think they're allergic or anything, thymine is, is, is not really going to be harmful and might potentially be helpful. Right? And then finally, something called flumazenil. What is flumazenil? It's actually a drug that, over, that can, get, can at least partially reverse benzodiazepine overdose. Okay? That sounds like a cool thing, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did you give the pencils in the first place? Well, and well, and here's the thing. We know if somebody overdoses on a benzodiazepine, okay, what are the chances? Or what what's what's the likelihood? If somebody's overdosed on a benzo, what's the likelihood of their relationship with that said benzo? They've been on it for a while, right? Either they have a seizure disorder or they have some sort of uh, psychiatric condition they're taking that benzodiazepine for, right? Uh, they're taking alprazolam, right, Xanax or clonazepam. They're taking it for anxiety or for sleep, and they're on it chronically, right, which means what? They've had a tolerance to it. They develop tolerance. They may be dependent upon it, and they may possibly be addicted, right? This isn't in our scope, so you don't have to worry about looking it up. Yeah, it's not one that's in our scope. Um, 
and this is why I'm actually getting to reason why it's not in there. You'd think at, at you think oh it's like Narcan for opioids right it's like Narcan for benzos, except here's a problem. If you have somebody who might potentially be prone to seizures, right? Either a seizure disorder or they're dependent upon right that benzodiazepine. What have you done by reversing that benzodiazepine overdose? And how do we treat seizures? But what have we done? Oh, does anyone see a problem here? Yeah, you, you really set your patient up for some badness here, right? Okay, so um, it is fairly rarely reported in the literature, but um, benzodiazepine overdose, first of all, is not often life-threatening. Believe it or not, benzodiazepine overdose, isolated benzodiazepine overdose is generally not life-threatening. Because what happens when you take too many benzos? You get sleepy, right? And a lot of people get sleepy before they take enough to outright kill them, okay? Because remember, benzodiazepines do not work directly upon the GABA receptors, right? They work through allosteric mechanisms. They make the body or they make the receptor respond more vigorously to GABA when it's present, right? So they're not direct acting. Um, so in general, they don't present as immediately life-threatening. They tend to be, you know, really tired, but, you know, they're not like an opioid overdose where, you know, they're, they are, some of your opioid overdoses are critically, critically ill, right? They're not breathing, they're hypotensive, a lot of stuff going on with them, okay? But we do know that reversing benzodiazepine overdose may present with a life threat. So a lot of your benzodiazepine overdoses, you know, even if they're not breathing very effectively, you can bag them, manage their airway, and, and just do good supportive care, and they'll be okay um, in a lot of cases. Some cases not. Um, now, the exception to this flumazenil is if you have a benzodiazepine naive patient. This generally occurs in people that have little to no exposure to benzos and that are in the hospital having a procedure done on them, right? They're having uh, what's known as conscious sedation or procedural sedation where you inadvertently overdose them with a benzo during the procedure. In those patients, flumazenil is going to have a better role because you're not worried about precipitating withdrawal, right? You're worried about reversing the agent that you injected into them IV, right? You, you actually, you know, atrogenically did this. You as an, a medical provider. Okay. Kids, occasionally this happens in. But in general, benzos can be, uh, be managed real well with good supportive care. Okay, moving on to GI decontamination. There are several ways we can decontaminate the gastrointestinal tract. Okay. We can lavage it. We can give activated charcoal, the binding agent. We can give ipecac, which causes you to purge, okay? Okay, those are the three major ways that we have available, potentially have available, but let's talk about this. In general, most patients are unlikely to benefit from GI decontamination. Why is that? Well, first, first and foremost, many substances are simply just not toxic or a non-toxic amount was ingested. And then finally, and very importantly, when do most patients present? After well after they've overdosed, right? So who is most likely to benefit? Well, if they present within an hour, okay? An hour or less, okay? If the agent that was taken was a delayed or sustained release, okay? the delayed absorption or a sustained release product. If the patient presents with signs and symptoms before absorption, full absorption occurs, okay? So if they overdose on something and it's, you know, within that hour and they're already having signs and symptoms, um, decontamination may be helpful. Or if they took a massive or life-threatening amount, right? They ingested three bottles of Tylenol, massive amount. Okay, 
But we always need to remember this right here. Many patients are just not honest or just don't know. They can't tell you. So they, they're not really good historians. And so toxicology history is a really, really tough one. So let's talk about some of the ways we can decontaminate. Let's talk about IPACAC. Guess what? There's no practical role for that anymore. And I actually talked about this earlier, right? And I even talked about how Dr. Divin was, was spearheading um, one, of the, one of the studies involving IPACAC. Okay, it doesn't have any practical role for us. Okay, possibly, I mean, you could make up some weird situation where, you know, maybe you're out in the middle of nowhere and you just happen to have a patient that just swallowed a bag of stuff right there in front of you. I mean, you could make some weird stuff up, but there's really no practical role for this stuff. Um, gastric lavage, what is that? Yeah, you quote unquote pump the stomach, and we're actually going to do that in the lab today. Um, okay, um, guess what? If your patient has ingested anything that's caustic, you don't want to lavage that stuff back up, right? So anything that is very alkaline or very acidic, right? So like Drano, right? Somebody overdosed on Drano, you probably don't want to lavage that stuff, right? Um, Volatile hydrocarbons. What is what does it mean? What is when I say something's volatile? What does that mean? No, it's actually not explosion. Is it vapor pressure? Vapor. It becomes a vapor very easily, right? Um, so, gasoline, for example, is volatile. And I know a lot of people think that means it's explosive. It is explosive, but volatile means it evaporates very quickly. It becomes a gas very easily. And so if you ingest something that's very volatile, okay, like gasoline, and you go to um, lavage that, as it's coming back up, it can turn into a vapor, and then that can get inhaled, right? It can get aspirated. Okay, so like paint thinners and lacquers and real volatile stuff, we tend not, we do, don't like to lavage that. If the patient has impaired airway clearance, they cannot protect their airway, do you have any business sticking a tube down their esophagus and pumping stuff? No. Um, or if they have a significant coagulopathy, what's a coagulopathy? Clotting disorder, right? Um, you want to be very careful because if you, you get some bleeding, right, that can be very, very problematic. You guys go with that? Okay. Um, Activated charcoal is probably the most common form of GI decontamination we use in EMS. And again, all of these need to be present to consider activated charcoal. And the good thing is, guess what? If the airway is patent, generally activated charcoal is safe and it's well, it's, it's well tolerated by the patient. Okay. Um, what's the dose for activated charcoal? One to two grams per kilogram, up to about 100 grams. We generally, if we can shoot for about a 10 to 1, and again, guys, don't write this. Up. You can write this down, but don't spend all day memorizing it. First of all, you're not. And second of all, remember, you're not really going to have a good idea of how much is in there. But in general, for activate charcoal to work, we want a 10 to 1 ratio. And that is to say you want 10 times the amount of charcoal as you have poison. Okay, so if somebody overdosed on 10 milligrams of poison, you'd want at least 100 milligrams of charcoal. Does that, that make sense? You want a lot more charcoal than you have poison because charcoal acts as kind of a binding agent, right? Cool. All right. Um, how, can char how else can charcoal work as, 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 as simply as a binding agent? Well, it can also enhance elimination through what's known as gut dialysis or intrahepatic recirculation. Some drugs undergo extensive enterohepatic recirculation. That is to say some drugs get secreted in your GI tract through your bile, and then as that bile with that drug goes through your intestines, it gets reabsorbed back into the body, right, where it's toxic again, and then it gets flushed out through the bile and reabsorbed again, and it gets recirculated, and it's the gift that keeps on giving. And activated charcoal will bind that, could potentially bind that in, and could inhibit that process. Does that make sense? Now, we're used to most drugs are eliminated where? 
Most drugs are the metabolites of the drugs are eliminated by the kidneys, but some notable exceptions have extensive GI elimination. And these include carbamazepine. What is that? That's Tegretol. What is that used for? Seizures, yeah. Um, phenobarbital to some extent. Theophylline. Some salicylates and sustained release drugs. Okay. Contraindications are the same contraindications as GI lavage. Caustics, volatiles, impaired level of consciousness. If your patient has a bowel obstruction or an ileus, charcoal, not going to be helpful there, right? In fact, charcoal can potentially cause an obstruction or an Ili uh, uh, bowel obstruction. And then drugs that are poorly bound, okay? Things like lithium, cyanide, Acids and alkalis, heavy metals, alcohols, and hydrocarbons are all poorly bound and, and are just are not bound particularly well by um, charcoal. Okie dokie. You guys cool with that? All right, moving right along. All right, moving on to enhancing elimination. One of the major techniques that we have available to us is urinary alkalinization. And we've talked about this before. You give sodium bicarbonate, and your typical dose is one milliequivalent per kilogram IV push. And that sodium bicarbonate makes the urine more alkaline, right? And we know that some drugs become ionized and non-ionized in high or low pH environments, right? The pH determines if the drug is ionic or non-ionic. Is that important? It is. Because if a drug is in its ionic form, can it pass through membranes very easily? No, right? Because it's polar, right? Polar drugs and metabolites tend not to pass through lipid membranes very easily, but non-polar drugs tend to easily pass through, right? Well, um, a classic example of this alkalinization, I think we've talked about this, is, is salicylates, right? Salicylates are converted into their non-ionic form in a high acid environment, right? And so they are e most easily absorbed. But in a basic environment, they are turned into their ionic form which means they can't go through the membrane. So what you happens is you can, uh, you can um, secrete the salicylates in your urine. And if you make your urine very alkaline, that will turn the salicylate into its ionic form and prevent it from passing or preventing it from getting reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, right? It stays in the urine. Okay, that's called ion trapping behind a charged selective membrane. Um, dialysis may work. Dialysis is particularly good against um, alcohols, lithium, salicylates, theophylline, phenobarbital. Generally, drugs that have a low molecular weight, okay, so can pass through membranes easily, and drugs with low protein binding. Because if a drug binds to the proteins in your blood, it stays in your blood, right? because proteins are large and can't easily be dialyzed. Um, small volume of distribution. You guys remember volume of distribution or apparent volume of distribution from pharmacology? What does that mean? That's a concept that refers to where a drug distributes once it gets absorbed, right? Going back to pharmacokinetics. Um, so a drug that has a large volume of distribution tends to go into fat, right? Tends to distribute into fatty compartments. And drugs with low volumes of dif distribution tend to stay within your blood plasma. And then kind of your intermediate volumes of distribution tend to be more protein. So small volumes of distribution are good, right? because that means that drug stays in your blood plasma where it can be easily dialyzed. And if you had to guess, do you think polar or nonpolar drugs are going to be easier to dialyze? 
bipolar drugs because they are in your plasma. They can interact with the dialysate. Okay. Here is a list of specific drugs and some of the antidotes associated with them. Okay. I'm going to go through these real quick. Okay. So acetaminophen is N-acetylcysteine or mucomist. Aspirin, alkaline diuresis, the uh, right urine alkalinization. Beta blockers, glucagon, barbiturates, dialysis, alkaline diuresis. Calcium channel blockers, glucagon, insulin dextrose therapy. Um, carbamates and cholinergics, atropine, carbon monoxide, oxygen, hyperbaric therapy, cyanide. Sodium nitrate, sodium thiosulfate, methylene blue, or hydroxocobalamin, which is what we carry. And remember, what, what, um, what drug can cause cyanide toxicity? It's a blood pressure agent. It's the yep, sodium nitroprusside. And nitrates in general, right, can actually um, do that. Uh, and then pits, pits of certain... Um, uh, fruits like uh, peach pits, um, I believe, can, can contain some cyanide. Apple seeds. Apple seeds to some extent, yeah. Is it apple cyanide or arsenic? Huh? Cyanide. Okay. Yeah. The pits, not the, the fruit. The seeds. The seeds, the pits. Uh, digoxin, or the foxglove plant, is digibind, ethylene glycol, either ethanol or fomepazole and dialysis. Guess what? Alcohol, ethanol actually has some potential benefit. Heparin, remember protamine sulfate. Okay, hydrofluoric acid is calcium. INH and hydrazine is pyridoxine. And remember we talked about hydrazine here because where's hydrazine found? It's found up at NASA. Different fuels and propulsion for satellites, satellites and rockets, things like that. Um, and INH, isoniazide, right, that's an anti-tuberculosis drug, um, and hydrazine, what do they do? They, they actually disrupt, they prevent us per, from producing GABA, right? And if we can't produce GABA, then our brains become overstimulated and we develop seizures and die from that. And those seizures will not respond to anti-seizure drugs for the most part. So we have to give back the substance, vitamin B6 or pyridoxine. Okay, we give this back to the patient and reestablish the GABA shunt. Iron, um, a chelating agent called defuroxamine. Um, lead and mercury, these are all heavy metals. These are different chelating agents. Ball is British anti-lewisite agent, uh, DMS. Um, succimere, particularly with kids. Uh, mercury the same, Met hemoglobin, think of methylene blue, methanol, the same thing as ethylene glycol, uh, nitrates, methylene blue, opioids, naloxalone, organic phosphorus, nerve agents, think atropine and 2-PAM, um, oral hypoglycemics, dextrose and octreotide, what is octreotide? Sandostatin. How does it work? It's very similar to it, it, somatostatin, right? Good. It inhibits the alpha cells. Alpha and beta cells, right? And that makes sense. If you if you overdose on something that causes your specifically your your alpha and beta cells to secrete insulin, then giving something that would inhibit that might be helpful, right? There you go. And then tricyclic antidepressants, sodium bicarbonate. And we'll talk about these in a little more detail, but these are some of the specific examples of agents that have some sort of antidote associated with them. Again, a lot don't. Okay, you guys cool with that? All right, moving right along. Okay. And then uh, just to review this again, even though we talked about this in respiratory with acid base, remember the anion gap, metabolic acidosis. Do you guys remember how to calculate the anion gap? You take your major positives and subtract your major negatives, right? What's your major positive? Sodium, Sodium right? You might add potassium, but potassium tends to be pretty small. So most people abbreviate it with this formula here. You take your sodium 
and you subtract from your sodium the chloride plus the bicarb, right? Your two major negatives. And your normal anion gap is about 12 with a range of about plus or minus 4. So an anion gap greater than 16 is significant. If you have a metabolic acidosis and your anion gap is greater than 16, that's significant. And you guys remember mud piles? These are the most common causes of an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So methanol and metformin, uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, peraldehyde, iron and INH, lactic acidosis, ethylene glycol, and salicylate toxicity. These are our common causes of an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. You guys cool with that? All right. And then finally, we'll start with the toxidromes. Okay. These are our bread and butter, with a few exceptions, such as aspirin and acetaminophen, which are relatively common, but they, that, those types of overdoses don't fit into the classic toxidromes, and so we talk about them separately. But let's go ahead and start talking about the toxidromes. Um, but before we finish with the toxidromes, I am going to get you guys on a little break. <laughs>